There is a difference in, in the BIM world between using models and building models. It's kind of two separate, separate workflows. It might sound like it's the same thing. And our opinion is everybody should be able to use models. Everybody mm -hmm. should be able to use it to some extent. Building models is a, is a different deal. When we start building these models in pre-con and for estimating, we're literally figuring out how to build it. So by the time we're actually out in the field, I might build five concrete models by the time we pour it. But that, mm -hmm. that final model is, is a fabrication level model. All right, welcome to SketchUp Talk, season four. We're talking some pro workflows with some pro flow workers. Ah, that sounded better in my head than the way it came out. I'm Aaron Dietzen. With me, as always, is Matt Robison. How's it going, Matt? Hello, I'm doing great. Pro flotionals, um, pro flotional workflows. I'm very excited um, <laughs> for whatever the pro stands for in pro workflows. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, can't express how happy I am to be back for SketchUp Talk Season 4. And also joining us uh, in the background is our super powerhouse producer, Aubrey. Say hi, Aubrey. Hello. Thanks so, for the introduction, Matt. Yeah, of course. So she'll be helping us out with uh, bringing people on stage and stuff in the background. So if you hear a disembodied voice, well, I guess if you're listening to it, everybody's disembodied. But um, That is true. Yeah. So if you hear another voice, that's who that is. Speaking of voices you'll be hearing from, our guest today is VDC manager Renzo DeFuria. He's going to come on and talk about virtual design construction and BIM, building information modeling. <laughs> Stumbled yep. over it. Oh, it's three whole words. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a good one. We're going to have a lot of uh, insight, I think, is what I'm excited with this one for. Uh, the um, BIM. He's a big BIM fan. Yeah. BIM head. Have you ever heard of the, uh, seen the movie a swim fan it's kind of like that but except he's a, just a big bim fan so isn't that about um, like a stalker yeah isn't that a horror film hmm I mean, okay so any kind of case you have the stalkers forget that <laughs> just bim guys i all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna give this disclosure up front um i have a sorted past with bim so i've been working in software specifically architectural engineering software for uh, over 20 years now. And uh, since that term BIM has been coming up in America, I've been involved and I have some, some opinions that I'm really gonna try not to let that sour my opinion on it. Um, so you I have think like BIM, nightmares about BIM. So it is a yeah. horror movie. You have some kind of- BIM, BIM, BIM. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I just, I, th I think that the concept, the idea of BIM is, is so good and necessary and needed. Um, I just still feel like we're not quite getting there, but uh, that's what I'm excited. That's why I'm so excited. This is this is an exciting episode for me because this is like, this is where I come from. So I'm excited and I don't have nearly the experience that Renzo does either. So I'm like on the outside of it and he's like in there, hands dirty, like Bim's just dripping down his arms and he's, <laughs> he's coated in it. So uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, hey, I also got to I did not get to say this last time, but uh, I did want to welcome you back, Matt, on air. So last season, season three, you weren't around. So I had to do it by myself. And uh, full disclosure, I forgot to turn a mic on during two of the episodes of SketchUp Talk season three because you weren't there. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, oh sorry that sounds like i blamed you for it that wasn't what i meant to do <laughs> i meant to say thanks thanks for being here and not letting me do that oh absolutely hey i'm, I'm happy to be back but uh, i'm sure that i would have left the mics off uh, a few times as well so hey no i yeah i uh you are done a great job of carrying on your back the entire sketchup talk uh franchise uh for you know we're into like syndication now i feel like you've you've brought us to the point of um <laughs> Yeah, this is like expert level uh, podcasting. So, um, yeah, congratulations to you. You know, you have uh, a lot you've you've accomplished thus far, but uh, of course, many many seasons to come here. So that's right. Well, and and I feel good knowing that expert level in a medium that is primarily recorded in people's basements. Um, I feel good. That that feels fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah we okay. definitely started off in the in the official studio and then moved into the basement so we you know we're <laughs> we're adapting to the workflows of the podcasters uh, that's right we're we're conforming <laughs> all right well hey let's i i think we're gonna use this time up so i think we should get on it let's i think we should it is time to uh bring our guest out so without any further ado we will bring out vdc manager renzo de Puri, everybody all right let's hear it for the man oh hey there's hey. renzo <laughs> hey welcome to sketchup talk renzo thanks for having me this is very entertaining. I I, I, I want to keep watching you guys. Oh. You, you get you have to join us to watch us now. So yeah, the price of admission is steep for you. Everybody else gets to sit back and watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we use the term VDC manager. Let's start with what I already spilled the beans. Virtual design construction. Um, but tell us about what what is a VDC manager? How does that work? Uh, where does that happen? Let's, I guess, just whatever you want to say about VDC. Well, okay. It's such a big topic and, and everybody has a different opinion and experience with VDC. So it's a, it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, so I'll, I'll just tell you, I mean, really simply, I was a, um, uh, a career superintendent uh, um, working for a large commercial contractor. And about uh, 17 years ago, I started modeling. I, uh, I modeled in uh, originally in SolidWorks, and then for the past 15 years, it, it caught on. So I come to work every day, and I build models, and I use models. Um, we specifically do con uh, construction tolerance models for the models that we build, and then I uh, teach people how to model and how to use models. So that's kind of my job, um, in a nutshell. Whatever happens, happens. So um, I. I'm like everybody else. I, I, I've been studying this and, and watching it on the internet and whatever. Um, and what I do every day isn't really what I hear, you know, over, you know, what, what BIM is supposed to be. So I understand the, the two sides of that, but um, I mean, it's a big question. So what it means to me is I take models and I apply, you know, construction experience and use that to make our, our processes better. It's really as simple as that. When, we, when we've just talked in the past, um, you have mentioned how a big piece of what you do is actually applying your own personal knowledge to the job. It's not just you. I feel like you undersold yourself. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> you just said, oh, I just model stuff. That's, you know, anybody with a 3D modeling software can model stuff. You bring in knowledge and experience and make the models of more value than they would be if somebody else just came and drew a, ho drew a building. Yeah, it, it's all actually about the experience and, and the and the construction process and the and the know-how. Uh, you, you have to have that to to uh, to get the full value out of the out of building the models. And actually, the act of building the models is very integral to that process. So, um, applying um, you know construction experience and and um, logistics knowledge and building a model just turns into something uh, that's that's better than the sum of the parts. So. The construction part's actually the more important part to, to our process. The, the, the modeling is the easy part. It's always the easiest part. You're the crafty vet who knows exactly which pieces of information need to be communicated to which you know group of folks at what time. Um, and that is, would you say that's fair to say that that's how you, what you implement when you're doing models that you are kind of picking which information to communicate to different people at different times. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. In fact, that is the biggest challenge of building a functional model that's 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 fabrication level is there's so much information and there's so many parties and there's so many agendas. Try to filter all that down to the actual stuff that you want to, to communicate and build and use is the hardest part. I mean, we have mm -hmm. way too much information and um, most of it is unvetted and, and it's in all sorts of different locations and people don't know how to talk to each other anymore and you know we we're all on apps and it's it's very very hard um to get that all in one place so i would say that's mostly what i do is interpret information and organize it and the way we organize it is in a model form so so i want to again i'm, I'm trying not to vent too much about my my bim thoughts I want to let you vent, vent about your BIM thoughts. But <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that's always got me is 
Um, first off, that term BIM, because everybody seems to have their own interpretation of what BIM is. I mean, for some people, oh, it's a 3D model. Other people, it's a spreadsheet. Or somebody else, it means that this particular set of data is in the model versus if it was, you know, it drives me crazy. But the biggest thing that gets me is people say, you know, BIM is one piece of software. And I know where this comes from because there's some marketing behind that interpretation. <laughs> but uh, what do you say to people when they talk about BIM being this piece of software or this one model or this one workflow? Yeah, well, our whole process is agnostic. We can use any software, or any hardware. So we'll use whatever software or hardware is most appropriate to solve the problem that, that we're dealing with. So I couldn't agree with you more. I've heard all of those arguments specific, specifically around SketchUp not being a BIM tool. Um, so we use a lot of software. Um, uh, for all kinds of different reasons, but uh, probably about half of all the work we do are SketchUp models. And SketchUp is very, very integral in our entire VTC program. About half of our models are, are SketchUp models. Uh, but we use everything else you've probably ever heard of. Um, but to me, it is all about process. And one of the things that I very much struggled at the beginning of this shift that we had to change the process in order to go into 3D it's like, I don't understand what the process is, you know, and now I have to invent it. Um, so it, it's really about process. And uh, I think it's um, uh, uh, more integral if you can make it uh, ag agnostic so that anybody can use whatever they want. And also we're trying not to radically change people's processes as well. So the models that we produce for people are comfortable for them. We're not mm -hmm. taking the way we're just adding to it and that's been a pretty important concept of how to adopt something new because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of roadblocks and there's a lot of passive aggressive uh, sabotage that goes on and when people don't want to do something they're going to find every reason in the world not to do it and um, uh, people have their processes for a reason and you just can't take it away from them so well, i mean I, hopefully that answers your question but we'll use whatever and i think that's the way it should be Mm -hmm. Yeah, reduce the friction and be able to kind of plug and play into everybody else um, so that, yeah, everything moves smoothly and that you're not, people aren't complaining about you, <laughs> right? <laughs> is important. Yeah, um, I look at it, the modeling as a language. It's a, for, it's a form of communication, just like music or dance or, or a computer program or something like that. And so you kind of have to have a, a common language and that's really the big issue i think is we don't have a common language uh mm -hmm. yet uh, in, in bim but you also have to you know have a common program that's that, that that's easily understood and that's where sketchup does plug in it's the easiest common language in a 3d language that that we can share so i'm plugging it i'm plugging sketchup because it, it, it's a completely valid bim tool well let me let me ask you that on that point so IFC is supposed to be the standard language, the standard file format for BIM. Um, why do you think it isn't that? Because you're not the first person to say that that, that, mm -hmm. that doesn't exist yet. Well, the IFC is for interoperability, um, and there's been a lot of progress that, with that. I mean, we use IFCs in SketchUp all the time, and we're going back and forth between Tecla and all other programs. So we really are very engaged in interoperability. In fact, we have to be because we use a lot of programs and then they change, they get updated, the interoperability changes. So it's, it's a big part of what we do. And, um, but you do lose information in any kind of conversion. So mm -hmm. um, you're probably generally better off to work in a native program if you're dealing with other native folks in that program. And uh, we just ran in, uh, into this on, on a, a really complicated um, formwork project where uh, we ended up using Rhino as the, the, the common language because it was going through a, a few different um, uh, organizations um, and we couldn't do a conversion within what we were trying to do. So we just settled on that for that particular project. So does that, is that regular that it will change project by project depending on who's involved and what the final deliverable is? Yeah, it kind of changes every day, actually. It's oh, like wow. whatever. Yeah, you take a little of this, a little of that. It's like cooking something. You put it all in a pot. It's got to taste good. So it depends what you have in the cupboard and, and who you're feeding. And we, 
we put that together all the time. VDC manager slash stew maker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yummy. I'm hungry. Well, that's, that's, that sounds kind of tasty. <laughs> uh, so, so you've how long have you been? I'm not sure specifically VDC management, but involved in the the effort of making BIM a reality. Fifteen years. Well, I mean, I've been getting paid to do it for 15 years <laughs> and I come to work every day doing it every day. So, yeah, it's, it's working for you so far. <laughs> so so in, in for the last 15 years, what what has changed about what BIM is? Wow, you're throwing me a hard one there. Well, it's pretty open. You can say you can say nothing. <laughs> we'll just move on. <laughs> No, no, I, 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 well, I do want to touch into that that you mentioned that, that BIM and VDC hasn't achieved its potential. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, there's pockets in the world of really fantastic um, VDC uh, case study examples, but I'd say there's probably way more that I would consider failures and um, behind the scenes wasted, a lot of wasted effort, and uh, the return on the investment uh, is not there. In fact, I think uh, you can find um, uh, proof that um, th that uh, it's in a lot of cases increased the cost of construction and made it more complicated. And uh, I mean, you can you actually see a trend in mechanical work to more and more bends, you know, and more and more valves and everything getting stuck in, in, in a ceiling, you know, like spaghetti. It's um, that, that's that's been a, a trend for years. And uh so applied incorrectly or in a way that's too complicated or losing sight of uh, what the end goal or operating without, you know, profound knowledge of construction, but, you know, IT knowledge instead um, has had a lot of unintended consequences. So you're not the only one that's had a bad BIM experience. A lot of millions of people have had it. And so that is one of the things that I have seen. There was a big uh, movement to do it. I think I feel like I'm sort of in the third or fourth wave of it. Um, and that there was a lot of damage done in those years in terms of a lot of people had bought into it and had really bad experiences and now are even more determined not to, you know, use it. So, <laughs> yeah. um, that's what I've noticed, but I've also right now seen a lot more adoption and we are, I think at a tipping point where I think we are going to go the other way. Um, and it is really vital and critical if we're going to change how we do business and have a digital future and, and go towards modularization and prefabrication that we have to have this skill set and we have to have it at a lot higher level than we have now. That's, that is, I, I have, I, I jotted down several questions there. I, I, <laughs> positive. So yeah, well, coming at, coming out just right on tacking on to the end of that, have you seen an impact of, so we're as a recording this, if you're listening to this in the future, we're, we are in the beginning, the, be, the first half of 2021. So we're, we're still all locked up in our homes for the most part. Uh, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, have you seen that, that uh, just the change, the way everybody kind of got locked in, is, has that had an impact on VDC? And, and is that, it seems like that information would be more important than ever and collaborating remotely is kind of a standard now. So has, has that had a big impact on what you've I seen? I think it has actually. People are finding ways to work remotely. Modeling is a, a perfect solution for that in a lot of cases. Um, for us as a VDC group, we never lost a step going virtual because we were kind of virtual anyway. Mm -hmm. So we've seen huge growth in, in, in our group and our business in the last year. So yeah, it's well, crazy. I've never been busier, so. Sometimes you just need a push, I guess. <laughs> Silver lining of a terrible situation. I, I guess so. Yeah, make make the best out of what you can. Wait, one other thing, I know Matt has questions too. I'm sorry, but I'm tr I'm trying to just add on to what you just asked or just said. Uh, you mentioned that there's that you've seen pockets of VDC success. Are those locations? Is that due to some sort of oversight, or is that just in specific types of of uh, projects? Where, where are you seeing it succeed? Well, I would I would uh, correlate it to more that there are certain groups of people that have had individual personal success and understood what 
it meant to them and pushed through the roadblocks and were stubborn enough to to make something that succeeded and it was really awesome because it's really easy to quit so that there's pockets of it for sure but i think it has to do with individuals that um you know we're talented and we're able to produce something you know more than the sum of the parts and having stubborn. a champion who's like there to make sure mm -hmm. everybody's in line and uh, yeah speaking the same language and continuing in the same uh mm -hmm. the same line yeah makes sense well that's it's, it's funny because i remember uh again this i'm coming at this from a software perspective i was not in the field building when you know bim became a, a proposed blessing and threat at the same time depending on what you were doing at the time but this concept of vdc manager in my opinion kind of came out of people not being able to just jump on and make v, make bim work right it said oh here's all this data here's this information and then everybody said great and then they all went off their different ways and did exactly what they were doing already. Um, it seems like when, as you're talking about that, that, that stubborn person who makes it work, is that that position of VDC management? Well, there's, there's definitely a complicated technical infrastructure that has to be put to play in place and a plan as well to herd everybody in and get them to plug into something. So as managers of VDC managers, that's really our job to, to get the plan implemented, to write it, to understand what, we're trying to produce and, and shepherd everybody and get it set up. The hardest thing is to get started, uh, the very hardest thing. And once you get it started, you can turn over the keys and people are, are uh, able to, to drive eventually uh, on their own. So I would say that's probably the number one thing that, that we do is, is set up, get, get the team set up for success. It, it, with, with that, do you, do you find yourself like, do you have a hard time getting buy-in from the, the, the separate pieces. So I know that as a manager, you're going out, you're talking to this guy, this guy, this guy. It's not like you just go hang out with the architect and then, hey, we're good. BIM's rolling. You mm. probably have a dozen, two dozen different entities you're working with on a given project. Yeah, that's that's taken a long time. I mean, when I first started, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm to do it and a lot less enthusiasm to pay for it. And uh, <laughs> um as long as it's free, everybody want to do it. But we had to sustain ourselves and make it so that we did get a return off the effort and at least pay for the, the the services, which is expensive. And it does have it does include our our need to do prototyping and, and learning new things to add to uh, you know the billable work that we do. Um, but you know it depends where where you're talking. I, I, I've been in Seattle for so long. I, I don't have any pushback there's a line to 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 do the services the money is in the budget but that was a lot that took a long time and a lot of you know um uh, relationship building and um a lot of trust and a lot of you know services that 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 uh, were executed well so they got what they paid for so um but you know i do work around the country as well and and um you know, some, some people are harder to convince than others. Fortunately for me, this is just me personally, I've gotten to the point where I, I can work with who wants who wants the services and there's a pretty long line. So that's where I go now. But in general, I mean, I would say other, other VDC managers around the country are certainly facing that problem where they don't know how to sell the service. They can't get buy-in. People are sabotaging it or passive aggressively sabotaging it or flat refusing to do it. Um, so, you know, that's that's something that hopefully, um, you know, we're, we'll smooth that out and bring more people up. Um, but the services have to be great, you know, and we, we, we can't be providing some of those terrible services that have been provided in the past that have somewhat got us in the situation we're in. <laughs> mm -hmm. What would you give like a up and coming VDC, aspiring VDC manager as like a piece of advice to um to build up that trust with with people how would you recommend that they um like what well, steps do you think that they should take you got to be the best you can be you, you be good and, and execute and i think everything else will fall into place as long as you're pro providing great services so you know uh, learning to network and build relationships that's very important the whole construction business is based on relationship i don't care what anybody said there that is the most important thing so 
I guess that would be the second advice is develop relationships and, and get to know people and, and communicate and contact. And, and then eventually, you know, you build up your, you know, your backlog of trusted uh, clients. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it seems like one thing that, um, that you've done that I know you've been involved in to kind of maybe build that professional network or help with, uh, maybe next generation coming in and is, uh, the visiting professionals program. Um, and I know you've uh, been involved with that in the past and I don't know, obviously COVID has had some changes to that, but, um, yeah, what, like, what has your experience been like in the visiting professionals program? Is it good to kind of get in there and talk to these, uh, up and coming folks or, um, Oh yeah, we love to do that. It's, it's real, great. Yeah. Real quick. I want to throw this out for anybody who doesn't know, the visit, Visiting Professionals program is actually a program put on by Trimble where they bring people who are actually doing it for real into educational locations, uh, higher education colleges, and get to talk to people, like uh, students who are learning about the craft of the actual, uh, well, position, like Renzo. Yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I've been part of that program for a few years, and and I speak at universities all the time anyway. I mean, we, we, we like to, to, to show what we're doing and, and hopefully inspire young people to come in and do this as a career or at least go in through it to some, some degree. Um, and there is a lot of enthusiasm for it. So I think as an industry, we've got a big burden to make sure there's positions available that are, um, are recognized uh, career path positions. And that's we're still having, you know, we're in early days with that, uh, the a construction technology career, uh, is, is not necessarily been fully supported and it's absolutely critical that we do that. So I can tell you, uh, talking to students, we, we have a lot of interest and, um, you know, we have a lot of people that want to, uh, come work for us as well. So that's, it's been great. That seems like it's what it needs is, is people can come in and say, here's how it really works because I get a feeling that that there's certain industries where you can learn as much as you want in a classroom, but when it comes out and you're in the field and every second is money. And I mean, it, there, there can't be much of a replacement for practical experience and knowledge. Yeah. I think what we show people are what's potential. I was something I would have liked to seen, you know, is like, what can you do if you, apply this and, and, and see, you know, how, how amazing it could be in certain situations, how to do it. That's a bigger, bigger thing, you know, cause mm -hmm. it's all process and processes is, is invisible. So uh, we like to teach that as well, but um, that you can't do in just a, a, a quick, um, <laughs> uh, you know, lecture or whatever that's on the job training experience. Mm -hmm. And I think also Trimble, uh, along with the Visiting Professionals program, to try to bridge that gap. Um, mm -hmm. Something cool they've done is these Trimble Technology Labs. Um, and I've had a chance to go to a couple. I don't know, Renzo, if you've uh, been in any of these, but um, it's pretty sweet. They have all the like you know newest, latest, uh, and greatest Trimble technology that people can get familiar with and learn how it fits in all these different workflows and goes together and stuff. And um, it's pretty astounding, the, the stuff that they do in there. Yeah, I haven't gone to one yet, but I think they just opened one at WSU, which is in my neck of the woods. So nice. I will be going to visit that one uh, when things open up a little more. Exciting. I, say that I think VPP rather than uh, is virtual practicing professional right now because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nobody's, nobody's actually coming in to speak right now. First thing on my list once everybody's vaccinated is Trimble Technology Lab. I was going to say a baseball game. Person, <laughs> yeah, that's to each their own. Each pastime to each uh, person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to add one thing that just popped into my mm -hmm. head here. It was kind of a another one of my personal pet peeves, or maybe that's the wrong word, but um, works for me. I, I think that um, to solve all this, you know, modeling VDC, all the problems, and to really get it to achieve what what it can be is to bring these younger people in and provide them a career path and support that career path and poof magic it's all going to get fixed i'm not kidding i think that is really sort of the roadblock right now in a nutshell of, of where we're struggling it is um, it's a hard career in the past to, to um, excel at and, and get rewarded for 
So yeah. is, are, are you saying that as being VDC management or are you saying that as in the, like the whole industry, everybody going out into a piece of building needs to, well, to buy into that or get, get trained up on it? So a lot of the early impression of a VDC person or a VDC manager, a BIM manager is more like a CAD operator that's doing CAD work, not, not like a builder using technology, a construction technology person. And so it has not, it, it's, it's, it's been viewed as sort of a career stopper instead of a career accelerator. And I mean, I've even had a lot of pushback that it shouldn't even be in a construction category. It should be separate like finance, you know, accounting or, or HR or something hmm. like that, not a construction family. I, I'll bet a lot of people still say that and still think that. So that has to be removed. It's, it's not only a legitimate construction career path, if it's done right, it's an accelerator because you can actually get more accelerated experience, uh, great operational experience. Um, and I still have some of this pushback that my group has looked at as like office people and they're not operational in the field. They're doing more operational work than many of the operational people in the field. And it's, they're not being necessarily recognized for that yet. So mm -hmm. we got we to gotta provide that as the career and i know there's the there's the want and so if we can provide that and plug that together uh they will solve all these problems because they're 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 totally solvable and they're human solutions when you talk about the want are are companies wanting to empower that person or is that something that somebody coming in has to be like, do they have to advocate for themselves or are companies out there going, we need a, a VDC manager who knows what they're doing? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that question. <laughs> um, I can only answer for, for, from my experience. And there hasn't been a, a total open understanding that that's a vial, viable career path, that it's a timeout, that maybe you do it for a little while, go do something else. And perhaps you got to do catch up after going through that um, and that uh, and, and a career for it would be, you know, not considered an operational career necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer what a lot of people or other people uh, have experienced, uh, but that's been my experience. That's, that's amazing. Cause it just seems like such a crucial piece of, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of something else in the building industry that has had such, a huge impact. I mean, maybe the creation of plywood, but I mean, <laughs> other than that, like what else has come along where it's been workful that's, you know, potentially going to touch every, every building being made. I think there's the want for it. You just have to have the um, environment that you can plug into it and make it work. So yeah. I think there's a little infrastructure. And again, this is just totally my experience. You know, Absolutely. I can't speak for anybody else that, that may have had an easier path, um, but that's what I've seen and that's what I've heard. And I do talk to a lot of people and that, mm -hmm. that's pretty much the theme I'm, I'm, I'm hearing. And I, I know that you're doing VDC locally here in the United States, but do you hear stories of different countries where there's requirements in place? Uh, somebody mentioned, I'm trying to remember where it was, Singapore. And you know, in the UK, there's requirements. Do you see more success there versus uh, some place where there is no government oversight on BIM requirements? Boy, I had no experience whatsoever, but it doesn't sound good to me. Okay. <laughs> government <laughs> oversight on something, does that sound like it's going to make it better? <laughs> I have no idea. So if anybody's out there from Singapore and having great success, I apologize. But um, I think requiring anything is a problem. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be executed without waste. And um, I think that's kind of my big pet peeve is, is you can do this for sure, but are you wasting stuff or are you getting a complete return on your investment? How, how much of it is actually being used and, and used properly? Or, or are, you, are, you, are you doing it in less time than it took you to do something else? I think those things all need to be analyzed and I don't think there's an easy solution, but I think when you require something, there's a built in pile of waste there um, that you probably have to dig through. So I don't really think requirements are the answer. I think providing great services are, is the answer. 
makes sense to me. I, I I'm bought in. I next next commercial building I build, I'm coming to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they say I'm not a salesman. Look, I, right. I'm I'm a few million short of starting, but yeah, I'm I'm the concept is solid. <laughs> um, all right, let's. Uh, we do have a couple questions that came in. Uh, Philip, you had the first question up here. Let me try to read his his question. Part of the BIM process I come across is a lot, particularly in dealing with a particular piece of BIM software from Autodesk. We can say the R word here. It's okay. It's, it exists. Revit is part of most people's BIM workflow. Um, uh, is interpreting the data that is included with various families. What level of data do you find you are needing in most of families? Or to put it another way, what data do you wish people would include but don't when they're building those families? When you get when you get uh, materials, I guess is there data that is or isn't being included that you like or don't like? I'm gonna reinterpret the question. <laughs> From a Revit model? Yeah. Well, we get tons of Revit models. You know, mm -hmm. we, we all have Revit. On, it's it's many 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 designers are using Revit. Um, it depends. You know what we're what what we're trying to use the um, the data for. Um, we build a lot of our own models. Um, and we, it's a really big part of what we do is model building. Mm -hmm. Um, so it depends. Uh, we, we don't build models very often in Revit and we do build our own models. So we'll take the data and the reference, uh, whatever is in there that we could use. A lot of times we take 2d out of there. Sometimes we take 3d and we build that up and, and, and reference it off, off of it. So it kind of depends what we're trying to do and kind of depends on the state of the models because, we get models in all kinds of state of goodness or disrepair. And so, you know, it sort of depends what we get. So, so let me, let me plug it. That, that's, that's a good answer. I mean, I guess there's no flat. Yes, this is good. Yes. No, this is bad. But do you think there is, can you envision in our future a spot where there is less redescribing models? Because I think that's what, everybody does right so whatever piece of the building you're responsible for you get this data it might be it used to be a plan now it's probably some sort of a 3d model probably in some cases still a pdf or a dwg and then you go make it again um do you see a a, a possibility of a light at the end of the tunnel where there's a standard file that that isn't redescribed so often maybe um, I don't see the light of the tunnel anytime soon, at least in our process. Um, it's, you know, models start out, the, those, those are design models. They're intended to, you know, convey design intent and produce contract documents. They're not fabrication level. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole industry has never been that way to begin with. That's why we do shop drawings and we submit mm -hmm. them and they end up being fabrication drawings. So we're always doing that re work anyway because that's our job so now we do it in 3d so i don't think there's any it's it's totally logical to do that but in terms of you know consistency file format ways to make that easier um certainly um, and we are doing that you know to to some extent uh, from designer to designer to, to do less work mm -hmm. um but a real big part uh and i guess i should I want to say there there is a difference in in the BIM world between using models and building models. It's kind of two separate separate workflows. It might sound like it's the same thing. And our opinion is everybody should be able to use models. Everybody should be able to use it to some extent. Building models is a, is a different deal, and it it it. Uh, um, to, but to me, it's the the highest value of uh, effort is in building models. So we've always our whole business in, it, that I've been developing has been based on model building and um, the very act of building it has is a big part of our workflow so it's i don't want to take somebody else's model because i'm not doing that i'm not actually putting it all together and when when we start building these models in pre-con and for estimating we're literally figuring out how to build it so by the time we're actually out in the field we've gotten the third fourth so you know we're building multiple models as well we're not just, you know, mm -hmm. internally, I might, I might build five concrete models by the time we pour it, but that, mm -hmm. that final model is, is a fabrication level model. And it's, it, 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 the, 
a lot of value in it, including um, a huge amount of our quality control of the project is because of that model. So it's, it's the process um, is more important than the actual model. So I know they call it building information modeling, like the, there's all this intelligence in a model, um, but the intelligence is really in the people. That's, that's what I, I, I have strived for and using the models to be able to bring all that together and, and make that knowledge better and have something standard and easy and, and easily talked about to be the focus of it, to bring people together. So, um, I think that was very well put. I think, I think it's the building information is very important and too many people get hung up on the model because the, the model is a, a way to convey that information one person to the next. It, it shouldn't be the focus. Because like you said, I mean, so I, I, I have experience uh, designing for a trust plant. And we would get plans all the time. And like, it's great that the architect went and drew lines like this, but they don't know how we design trusses, so it's it's not useful. And people don't, I think, always appreciate the fact that in building in designing it before you build it you're actually saving time saving energy you know what's going to come up where the hiccups going to be where the issue is going to be if you've designed it and if you grab somebody else's models went out to the field with it you're in the worst place to be because <laughs> that's when mistakes get made and they're expensive to fix all right um we have one more question joseph did you want to hop up here he does so i'm going to bring you up joseph here we All go. Right. I'm inviting you on screen. Awesome. Hey, All Joseph. Right. Welcome to Sketch and Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I get to ask a question, I guess. You do. Um, my question is, what has been the biggest challenge as a VDC manager, and how can companies like Trimble or softwares like SketchUp could help in that aspect? Awesome. The biggest challenge? I guess I would have to... Uh, <laughs> Um, that's another big question. Hard to hard to come up with an easy answer. There's so many problems. <laughs> Can we come up with one. I uh, I guess I would say, um, you know, I, I, um, when, whenever you're trying to do something new, something uh, in, you know, uh, it, perhaps innovative and hasn't been done before, do pro prototyping. Uh, that's a lot of what we do is try to, to, to prototype essentially. I don't think people look at it as, as a prototype. Prototypes are very, very hard and they're expensive. And um, um, I, I, I don't think that that effort is ever appreciated because uh, in the final product, it's all invisible. So mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to quit. So the, the hardest part is to not quit and to push through and to ignore all the no's. I mean, my average for no's is usually three. I usually the first no is just the first no, and you got to mortar three. So um, I don't know how you know software can um, uh, solve that, or how Trimble can solve that. The the the, the difficulty of of uh, motoring through trying to really implement something so that it becomes repeatable. Um, I think it's more of an environmental thing and an institutional thing, and an acceptance that prototyping is important and essential, and that it, that it requires a different management style and a different uh, type of support. So the bottom line is don't give up. You gotta be stubborn and not give up. But... So if, I see, so I see. Did if that answer your question mix... sort of? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. So okay. all great. So basically Trimble just needs to come up with some good like mind control software <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I heard you're working on that. Oh, no, no you didn't. Oh, uh... <laughs> uh, perfect. Awesome. Well, Hey, we are about at time. So, um, I think before we wrap up, I just want to ask you, is there, is there anything else you want to say while, uh, while you're here, anything else you want? Words, any more pearls, words of wisdom you want to throw out, Renzo? Oh, you're, you're talking to me. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't oh, want to hear what Matt yeah. has to say. Oh. I, I could. <laughs> I go down rabbit holes. I could talk about this forever. So, but uh, I really just wanted to, just, to say I enjoyed this experience. It's been kind of strange and cool at the same time. I've never really done anything like this before, and it, it was. It's actually a lot of fun. 
So great. I think that's the new tagline, strange and cool. (laughs) (laughs) That was on my first business card. (laughs) Not my normal day at work. That's doing this though. Well, us either. This is this is great. I mean, this is a, a kind of a, a highlight of our job is, is getting to hang out with uh, ex- experienced professionals like you and learn. This is this was fun. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on, Renzo. Thanks for being part of SketchUp Talk. Uh, thank you, guests, for hanging out with us. Um, hopefully, it was worth everybody's time. Hopefully, everybody got something out of it. I know I got some things. I actually have. I actually have notes that I that I took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I need to go back and watch it again right now and uh, just mark down everything that uh, I need to absorb because there was so much, you know, so many pearls oh, of man. wisdom in there that I'm like, oh boy, There's so good. Yeah. Right, so yeah, very much appreciate. It. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Um, thank you, Aubrey, for producing us. And uh, I think that is about it. We will uh, be seeing you next time. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on SketchUp Talk. Yeah, thanks, folks. This has been a Trimble Media production. Thank you for listening to SketchUp Talk. If you liked what you heard here today and you have an idea for an episode or a guest, you can drop us an email at podcast at sketchup.com. If you have a specific question related to how to do something in SketchUp, check out our forum at forums.sketchup.com. Thank you.